Hello, I'm Joe McFarlane. I'm author of this book, Edwell Wild Mushrooms of Illinois and Surrounding States. And, uh, welcome to this virtual mushroom program of sorts. I want to thank the uh, McCracken County Public Library for in Paducah for this opportunity to talk about some of the facts about wild mushrooms and other fungi found in our heartland region, including where mushrooms actually come from, what they're doing out there in nature, and also for those of you who like to eat once in a while, how to go about finding some safe, edible mushrooms that are out there and not die as a result, which can be done. So, what are mushrooms? Well, they're not more what many of you think. Mushrooms are not plants. They're not even related to plants, actually. They're in their own separate biological kingdom. You've probably heard of the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom. Mushrooms don't fit into either of those categories. The kingdom fungi is where scientists classify mushrooms and other fungi. And uh, here's something weird to illustrate how different mushrooms actually are compared to plants. Mushrooms are technically more related, closer related to animals than plants. Um, the animal kingdom. So it's a long story, but the fact that fungi don't produce their own energy through photosynthesis is, is one reason uh, fungi are different. Fungi get their, fungi get their energy by uh, tapping into the resources around them, such as the carbon locked up inside of a dead log, or, or a fungus might latch onto the roots of living trees and steal some of the sugars the tree is producing. At the same time, they can uh, give back to that tree by producing extra moisture and nutrients. Now, fungi work cooperatively to maintain a healthy forest. It's basically give and take where the fungus and other forms of life both benefit greatly. Another difference between plants and mushrooms is the fact that mushrooms are made up of a totally different structural material than plants. Mushrooms aren't composed of cells uh, with cellulose and lignin like plants. Mushrooms don't even have cells. They're made primarily, primarily of something called chitin, which uh, animals and insects also produce as part of their bodies. Fingernails, the shell of an insect, hair, that's chitin. Um, so, in these fundamental ways, uh, mushrooms are very different than plants. But even as plants and fungi everywhere interact and often depend upon each other for a healthy life. So, where do mushrooms come from? And what are they up to? Think of mushrooms not as these independent growths that uh, appear to be, but uh, as a small portion of a much larger form of life that created the mushroom. Mushrooms are fruiting bodies. They're uh, the spore-bearing reproductive parts of a fungus. Like apples on trees, or tomatoes on vines, or blackberries on a bush, they're just a small part of a much larger form of life that's attached to it. But the much larger fungus attached to the mushroom is something we generally don't see. And that's because the rest of the fungus that's attached to the mushroom is hidden underground, or in wood, or some other host. And that quote-unquote parent fungus that produced the mushrooms is composed of zillions of microscopic threads of fungi that are connected like a huge spider web that reaches into nooks and crannies, extracting and dissolving and releasing nutrients. And those nutrients can utilize and share with other forms of life. So the rest of the fungus that produce those fruiting bodies is, is kind of like a giant oak tree producing little acorns. There's, uh, they're, they're fruiting bodies, basically. The acorn is just a fraction of a much larger form of life. It's not the complete plant. So when we pick a mushroom, it's basically as harmless to the fungus that produced it as it would be picking apples on trees. What we just picked is not the complete structure. It's just the comparatively small fruiting body of the fungus that put out there to create new fungi. And of course, the purpose for fruiting bodies, whether it's apples or acorns or mushrooms, is to reproduce. And how do fungi reproduce? Well, inside the apple are seeds, and we all know how apple seeds produce apple trees. Yet mushrooms don't have seeds. You probably know that. They have something called spores. And while spores are not exactly like plant seeds, and both are different in fundamental ways, it's okay to think of the zillions of microscopic spores mushrooms produce as the quote-unquote seeds of fungi. So that's what mushrooms are. Just like apples and acorns, mushrooms are the fruiting bodies of a fungus. And just a small portion of the larger form of life that produce those spore-filled mushrooms. So, if mushrooms are the fruiting bodies of fungi, let's pause for a moment to get our words right. You're at the library. You didn't think you'd get away with this from the library without learning something, did you? Well, so here's your words of the day. Let's sort out the correct usage for those Latin words fungus and fungi. People mistake the two or use them interchangeably. Uh, I should point out the correct pronunciation for these ancient Latin words is actually unknown. 
Latin is what's known as a dead language, meaning no population on earth actually speaks Latin as their regular language anymore. So it's been, it's been that way for a zillion years now. So we don't, honestly don't know exactly how those Latin speaking people would have pronounced the words fungi and fungus. We do know the difference between those words. And the difference is that one word is singular, the other is plural, like morel versus morels. Fungus is singular, while fungi is plural. To give you an example of how we might use fungus or fungi correctly, remember, it's singular versus plural. So if we're talking about the trillions and trillions of fungus spores floating around anywhere, everywhere, we could say fungi are everywhere. But if we're talking about a single fungus, such as the stuff growing on the jar of applesauce in the back of your refrigerator, that's singular. It's one fungus. Now, if we also happen to notice that black mold that sometimes grows on the rubber seal at the edge of your refrigerator door, you've seen it, that's a fungus too. And it's a different species of fungus than what's on your applesauce. So we could now say there are fungi growing in your refrigerator because fungi is the plural form of fungus. There, you've learned something. So if fungi are everywhere, how do they get there? How do they grow? Well, it all starts with those spores, the seeds of fungi. And just like that giant oak tree starts with a relatively tiny acorn, the huge fungus growing and branching out started with a tiny spore. And while they're microscopic, we've actually all seen spores, clouds of them anyway. When we're out hiking sometimes, we might step on an old dry puffball. A puffball is a kind of mushroom. Clouds of spores will billow out when we stop on those old puffballs. That's one way we can, that's one way we can see spores. Most of those millions and millions of spores never, never actually land in the right spot and start growing to form a new fungus, but once in a while, a lucky spore gets to the right spot. Floating through the air or in the wind is one way spores get around. Spores wash into rivers and lakes. Spores also get eaten as part of a mushroom. Maybe an insect was eating a mushroom and then that insect gets eaten by a bird and that bird later deposits the spores 30 miles away. So spores get around. So those microscopic spores get transported someplace and maybe land in a really good spot and start to grow. A fungus is born. In this case, the spore has landed on this grassy hillside where it found the habitat agreeable and to its liking. And so the newly growing fungus expands outward in that nice habitat. Typically, the fungus grows outward in a bigger and bigger circle. It's a bit like tossing a pebble in a pond. The ring will expand outward and growing larger and larger from where it started. And that's generally how soil, soil fungi grow, expanding out in a bigger and bigger circle, latching onto nutrients it can utilize and convert, also feeding other forms of life as it does so. And how big does that ring get? Well, it can grow and grow and grow until it becomes something called the humongous fungus. You might have heard of this. A uh, soil and root fungus growing out west, a single fungus covers literally miles of land, many miles, square miles of land. And it's actually considered the largest living thing on Earth. But in this case, we see here, the fungus is relatively small. Um, yes, we don't actually see the fungus growing in the soil in this picture, but we do get to see the fungus without digging it up and looking at it under a microscope because some fungi in the soil can leave evidence above ground of what's going on underground. The thing is, uh, soil fungi can and do affect plants on the surface. Uh, the outer edges of the growing fungus is where the action is, and the nutrients are being absorbed from the dead organic material, grass clippings and such, and then converted and released. And other forms of life can benefit from those released nutrients. It's like fertilizer being sprinkled, sprinkled at the outer edge of that ring of growing fungus. So as a result, the plants that are fortunate enough to be growing there really brighten up. They're suddenly thriving and full of green energy, healthy as can be. And then that, that burst of nutrients gets processed and the fungus continues growing outward and moves on. And the inner portions of that ring no longer offer that bonanza of nutrients being released by the growing fungus ring. So you might have noticed these mysterious dark green rings sometimes in your lawns, or in this case, it's a portion of a ring. If you've ever wondered what causes them, that's what's going on. It's perfectly natural. It's a soil fungus. And your lawn is actually very happy to have that is a part of its healthy ecology. There's no need to panic, no need to supply fungicide or anything like that. The fungus is totally harmless to you and is actually helping your lawn by helping recycle the nutrients. So then one day that circle of growing fungi and expanding, it decides conditions are 
right? And it forms a whole bunch of mushrooms all around the outer edge of that ring where the nutrient party is going on. Now, instead of seeing a mysterious dark green ring in the grass, we see an even more mysterious ring of mushrooms and wonder what on earth is going on? Well, why would mushrooms grow in a circle? Well, they're called fairy rings. And here's a fairy ring my neighbors Daniel and Annabelle discovered last summer, and they jumped right in. Now, two things to consider here. One, um, is it safe for innocent children to play in a circle of mushrooms out in the yard? And they're poisonous mushrooms, too. The green sport lepiota that they're standing around is actually a poisonous mushroom. Um, but also, why are they called fairy rings? Well, the reason they're called fairy rings, believe it or not, has nothing to do with science. Long ago, in ancient times, people didn't understand the biology of how mushrooms sometimes grow in circles, and the fungus in the soil we know is in the ground was invisible before the microscope was invented. So, back in the Middle Ages or so, people decided to call these mushroom circles fairy rings because, well, obviously, if mushrooms pop up in a circle, that must be where fairies were dancing in circles last night, and those exhausted little dancers obviously needed these little convenience mushroom stools to sit on. And that, for some reason, made sense back in the Dark Ages. So the term fairy ring was invented to explain what science had not yet explained. And even though we know the truth about those dance parties today, uh, we still commonly call them fairy rings because, well, it's fun. And science doesn't have to spoil all the fun. So, another thing to note here is that Annabelle and Daniel already know this, uh, that anyone can stand right next to a poisonous mushroom, and as I said, the green sport lepiotas you see here are in fact poisonous, you can stand right beside them without the slightest risk. Uh, my neighbors also learned that you can even touch these poisonous mushrooms without any serious risk, because merely touching a mushroom will not harm you at all. So feel free to touch any mushroom you find out in nature, especially if you're trying to identify it, because you really do need to look at the whole mushroom anyway if uh, you're trying to identify mushrooms. Looking on the cap, for example, or examining the base of the stem can be important features you need to check. If you're collecting mushrooms to eat, making an absolutely positive identification is obviously rather important. So, I don't need to tell you that some mushrooms are poisonous. They are. Some are deadly poisonous. While others will merely, merely make you wish you were dead. The green sport lepiota won't actually put you in the cemetery like you see here, but it is one of those mushrooms that can make you wish you were dead. Painful cramps and vomiting and bathroom agony and all that stuff. So it goes without saying the green sport lepiota is a mushroom you do not want to eat. It's a really common summer mushroom you find on lawns all around Paducah and everywhere in our region. It can be pretty large and tempting, tempting to some mushroom pickers. It's reported to be rather tasty actually, but uh, Taste or other features uh, like color or habitat alone won't tell you if a mushroom is actually edible. And unfortunately, there's no magic test you can perform to find out if a mushroom is edible. And uh, ignore anybody who tells you otherwise. Honestly, uh, or anything you see online or anywhere else that says this or that is how to identify a poisonous mushroom or edible mushroom, it's wrong. And it can be dangerously wrong. So stay away from that. The fact is, you have to learn to identify edible mushrooms before eating them. Sorry. <laughs> surprise, surprise. So, how do we identify the many thousands of different mushroom species out there? Well, start by looking at certain features and traits, such as where was it growing? That can be a really important clue. Some mushrooms, such as the green spored lepiota, grow only out in grassy areas and nowhere else because, because the fungus that creates those mushrooms lives only out in grassy areas, never inside wood, for example, or on the edge of your refrigerator door or on top of your applesauce. <laughs> Some mushrooms can uh, grow only on wood, such as the Volvariella bombacina. You will not find this species growing on your front lawn, ever. You won't see it on the forest floor, ever. On trees, fallen logs, that kind of habitat, on wood, and only on wood. That's where this mushroom grows, because the hidden fungus that produces this mushroom, the fungus uh, we know that's connected to the mushroom, it grows only on wood and nowhere else. Some other features, such as the color of the gills beneath the cap, can be diagnostic too. Here we see pinkish gills. Hmm, that's a feature. Or what's at the base of the stem? Like this cup-like tissue we see this mushroom specimen is growing out of. These are diagnostic traits. Smell can actually be an important. Or taste. 
a tiny taste, just just a touch of the, the raw mushroom on your tongue uh, might reveal a bitter taste or peppery hot. And those tests can be important clues. Don't swallow the mushroom, of course. <laughs> Spit out what you, what you taste. But a tiny taste, just, just a little touch on your tongue, is basically harmless. So, the silky volvariella, it's called silky because the cap is covered with silky fibers. Ah, that's a feature. Also, what's under the cap can be a major clue. A huge group of mushrooms that don't have those gills we see under the cap. Some mushrooms will have pores instead. The gills and pores are where the spores are produced, and various fungi have evolved to produce their spores in some fundamentally different ways. So when you see a mushroom on the ground, you want to, and you want to identify, look under the cap. If it has gills, it's in one big group. If it has pores, it's in another. The thing is, you might not be able to identify it unless you look, since some mushrooms look quite similar from above. So the mushrooms with, with pores also have a tendency to change color when they're scratched or bruised. And that, that can be a really helpful trait as well. Fun, too. Uh, some of the groups, uh, some of the mushrooms uh, with pores are commonly known as boletes. They're, they're, they're fun to test because uh, if you have a really steady hand, you can scratch a message and write something under the cap. Uh, some mushrooms turn red when scratched or cut, or some will turn blue or black. Uh, some mushrooms also produce a milky liquid in one cut. Uh, and maybe the liquid will be blue or, or taste peppery. All of those are traits as well. Now, one of the biggest things to consider uh, might be the color of the spores. That's because some mushrooms that look a lot alike might have totally different colored spores. One species might produce rusty brown spores, or another species might have white spores. That can be a critical identification clue. The problem is a, a single spore is microscopic, and nobody can see the color of a single spore without a microscope. And since we don't carry microscopes out in the field, that can be a problem for most people. But uh, we can do a little trick called make a spore print. And uh, uh, making a spore print can show you the color of the spores without using a microscope. So zillions of microscopic spores falling out of a mushroom cap can be collected on something uh, over the course of several hours or overnight. And those uh, zillions of spores massed together can reveal that diagnostic color. Here's a spore print made from the green spored lepiota, that poisonous mushroom we've been seeing a lot of here. Uh, the green spores. Hmm. Well, green spores, well, we won't be eating that mushroom today, anyhow. So, of all the tests we can do, and there are a number of other tests we can do, such as putting a drop of ammonia or some other chemical mixture on the mushroom, none of those tests will tell you directly if a mushroom is edible. I'm sorry if you came here expecting otherwise, but there's no simple test anyone, anyone can do to identify edible mushrooms. Sorry. If something you see on the internet or your know-it-all brother-in-law says otherwise, they are wrong, period. You just have to learn to identify mushrooms. So, if there are thousands of different species of mushrooms out there, and, and there are, some of the metal, some of the poisonous, some deadly poisonous, how can we learn them? Well, the old joke about how do you eat an elephant comes to mind, one bite at a time. With mushrooms, you learn to identify mushrooms one at a time. Here's the good news. You don't need to learn to identify all of the mushrooms out there if you want to learn to identify uh, some, some of the edible mushrooms. Again, you can run them one at a time. Take chanterelles, for example. That's a yellow chanterelle in the top photo. Chanterelles, and there are a few different species of chanterelles around here. All of them are edible. They can be fairly common in our woods from early summer through autumn. And they're very common sometimes. They're pretty tasty, too. Unlike morels, they're bright orange and they can stand out and be easy to spot, so that's nice. They're, and they're fairly easy to identify, positively, if you pay attention. So, you learn to identify the yellow chanterelle by looking for specific features. And you'll want to compare those specific features with other mushrooms, and other mushrooms that kind of have similar features, lookalikes, mushrooms you, mushrooms you might confuse with edible chanterelles. Especially mushrooms that look like chanterelles but are poisonous such as the jack-o'-lantern, seen here in the bottom photo. Both mushrooms are kind of orange, and so that could be trouble if the only thing you're looking for is orange mushrooms. Both mushrooms have gills under the cap that also run downward onto the stem a bit. Not a ton of mushrooms are like that, so that's a helpful feature. Both mushrooms grow around certain trees. So how do we tell them apart? How do we know one's edible and the other will send you right into the bathroom? <laughs> um, well, here's one thing. 
the jack-o'-lantern glows in the dark. That's where it gets its name. It's orange. It often shows up around Halloween, and the jack-o'-lantern, well, it glows. And while it is poisonous, I still love to collect the jack-o'-lantern whenever they pop up in late summer and fall. And again, again, touching poisonous mushrooms won't hurt you. Being near them won't hurt you. So, trusting science, I like to take a basket full of jack-o'-lanterns fresh, bring them into my room at night, and then drift off to sleep. You don't see the glowing gills instantly in the dark. In, in, the, in the Midwest, your jack-o'-lanterns glow rather faintly, so your eyes need to adjust to the dark completely before you can actually see them. But once your eyes are totally adjusted to the dark, such as when someone flips on the light while you're sound asleep and it seems like it's blinding light, but it's only because your eyes are very well adjusted. That's how well adjusted to the dark your eyes need to be to see the jack o' lantern. But it really is a cool show. Um, I'll wake up once in a while during the night and I can definitely see the basket full of jack o' lanterns glowing in the room. It's like aliens have landed or something like that. It's a lot of fun. So even if mushrooms are poisonous, and these are poisonous mushrooms, they can still be really fun and fascinating. So all mushrooms are, really are incredibly cool, all of them. Now, if you want to learn more about mushrooms and the kingdom fungi, there are some groups out there you can join. And those clubs and organizations host public, public events called forays, where you can head out to the woods with other mushroom lovers and mushroom scientists known as mycologists who can teach you in person how to collect and identify mushrooms. Here in our region, we've got a couple of nice events planned for later this year. Right here in Illinois, in Makanda, where I'm at, the second annual Makanda Mushroom Festival is planned for October 14th through 16th on Crab Orchard National Wildlife Refuge near Giant City State Park. There's more information about that online. You can check it out. And then the big one, the North American Mycological Society's annual foray is being held right over in Potosi, Missouri on September 29th through October 2nd. That's pretty lucky for us because North America is a big place and the once a year North American Mycological Association foray, or the NAMA foray as it's called, it might be held anywhere in North America, Canada, or California, Pennsylvania. This year it's right in Potosi, Potosi Missouri basically in our backyard, so you might want to check that out. Finally, if you prefer to read a really good book full of fascinating things about edible mushrooms, uh, mushrooms you can find right here in our region, along with recipes about how to cook those amazing mushrooms. A spectacular book called Edible Wild Mushrooms of Illinois and Surrounding States is available wherever books are sold. It's online, it's in nature centers and gift shops and such. We put about 40 different adult species in the book, plus pictures of lookalikes. The book's for beginners and serious mushroom hunters and everybody in between. And on the cover, we put that mushroom you just learned, yellow chanterelles. You know that mushroom now. It's the one that doesn't glow in the dark. Unfortunately, the ones that you see on the cover of the book, you will not find it growing around here anywhere because I ate them years ago and they were delicious. So, thanks again to the Rackin County Public Library for hosting this online mushroom program and giving us all the excuse to get outdoors and go for a hike, work up an appetite, and maybe if we know what you're doing, actually come home with something to eat. And with that, I will see you all in the woods.